I'll just go back for for anyone who's following the live stream, and um, that's you people out there, I think. Um, if you can get that URL, on that URL, you can participate in the event and uh, add your suggestions too. Okay, um, so the theme of my talk is on making e-learning social and collaborative. Um, I'll start with a bit of background, but the majority of the talk will be practical and suggesting practical tools and activities. But just to give you some idea of kind of where I'm coming from, there's a, there's a quote there from a, a paper called The Future of Thinking, which was put together by Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, I've split it into three um, for you to decide whether you agree with those three quotes or not. If you're on the back channel on, our, on today's meet, then you can type in your response there if you'd like. I mean, it's suggested that education is in crisis, and over the past two decades, the way we learn has changed dramatically. Don't know how many of you would like to agree with that. We'll do a sh quick show of hands for the people in the room. Who agrees with that? Ch the way we learn has changed dramatically? Any yeses? Yeah. Um, we have new sources of information and new ways to exchange and to interact with information. Agree? Yeah, hopefully everybody agrees with that. <coughs> and the last one, schools and the way we teach have remained largely the same for years, even centuries. Agree with that? It's a bit, it's a bit more, uh, it's a bit less clear cut than that. I mean, looking at this room here, I mean, I think we could sort of go back, take the technology away and go back centuries and, you know, you've got a person in front of a board and loads of people listening. You know, that, that hasn't changed for centuries, I think. It's fair to say. So. What I like to think about is what, what the technology adds to education. Um, we've talked about Web 2.0 in the past, and now I'm thinking about Education 2.0 and e-learning 2.0. What does it mean? What can, we, what can this technology add for us? Um, going back to where we were, I found this nice video on YouTube of, of Skinner and teaching machines. So if we look back to the sort of early days of e-learning, um, this might be quite familiar for some of you. I'm going to stop that because you can watch the rest of it at home. And uh, does that kind of look familiar to you? For, for me, it looks very similar to this. You know, any of you who've worked a lot in e-learning and, and, and sort of language labs and things like that will, will find this a bit familiar. Anybody worked in a room like this? Yeah. I spend an awful lot of time working in rooms like this, and I have to say, to be quite honest, I hate them. You know, I can think of nothing worse. You know, whenever I go to a, a computer lab in a school or a university, it's almost always in a room with no windows. Well, you know, why is that? You know, it's all, almost always in this kind of lockstep kind of um, computers embedded into desks. Um, as you'll see, there's no peripherals, there are no webcams, there are no headphones, there are no speakers. All of the things that we can use to, to, to get computers to help us to communicate are very often missing. You know? And those are the kind of environments that I still often work in today. And I find that really difficult, I think. And that, that's kind of sad. And that takes me back to sort of Skinner's teaching machines of the 1950s. You know, for me, that's not what e-learning is about. No. 
Anybody recognise this guy? His name's there, so maybe you should. This, this is a guy called Salman Khan from something called the Khan Academy, and he's pioneering something that's called flipped learning, which he says will help us to liberate uh, creativity within the classroom. Um, I have kind of mixed feelings about this, because it's, it's kind of based around the concept that if you, if you take a lecture and you put it online and students watch it online, they can come to the classroom and then in, spend the classroom time interacting about what they've learned in the lecture. Sounds quite good in some ways. In other ways, that I, I feel though, if, if you take a boring lecture from a, from a classroom and put it online, it's still going to be a boring lecture. You know, we still need to be build in collaboration, social activities, and interaction around those kinds of lectures. Just taking what, what doesn't work in the classroom and putting it online doesn't make it work. Oh, something I forgot to say. At the end of the presentation, you'll be able to let, download all of the presentation and the links. Okay? So if you're worried about um, grabbing URLs and making notes of them, don't worry, you can download it all at the end. Okay? So just relax and stuff. Um, so if, if those things are, are what it's not about, what should it be about? This is, this is a little bit of research from something called in, engaging students on their own terms. And this is the kind of things that it says that teens do. in their daily social lives. Does, do you think this reflects um, accurately the sort of students you teach? Teenagers averaging 3,339 texts per month. And who has to pay for it, huh? <laughs> yeah. Okay, if this is what our teenagers or our students do in their social lives, shouldn't this be the kinds of things that we reflect in the learning activities we give them? There was a conclusion in this paper that engaging students on their, on their own terms should include these things. I've highlighted the bottom in red because that's the part that I think is kind of really important. Technology rich, highly engaging, fun learning experience that reflect real world skills. Okay. I've got another little video here which you can watch when, when you download the presentation and it reflects something called the network student based around a theory called connectivism and it's a theory of learning that posits that if we connect students and get them interacting through social networks and exchanging information above the, about, with, among themselves this is a more efficient way of learning okay when you get when you download the presentation you should be able to just click the image and that will play Um, for now I won't listen to the whole thing because we're short on time but you can have a listen to it at home and, uh, and see how I think learning should be if you're on our back channel let's go back to our back channel here actually let's. I'll pass that link to you and you can have a look at it now as long as you don't have the sound up. There you go. Yeah, yeah. OK. Just checking what people are saying. OK, good, great, good. OK, so the, the rest of my presentation is going to be suggestions for ideas for how to make um, e-learning more interactive and social and collaborative. The first thing 
we've looked at already really is using this back channel in lectures and in classrooms is, is something that I found incredibly useful especially teaching with in a classroom that, that has um, in internet connectivity and students on computers uh, one of the main problems that I have with students is always getting them to type in URLs correctly when you're sending them to websites and this is sort of one of the perfect solutions because uh, basically because all you have to do is send them to send them to the page and they can just click on the link and they're already there so it's a good way of passing around the links and getting students to participate in classes um, for those of you who are connected here now how many have used a chat room or a back channel in this way can you type in a yes or a no please Yeah, maybe. <laughs> oh, we got some. The, the yes people were quicker to put their yeses in, but a lot of no's there. But that's good, you know. So at least we know, you know. Hopefully, you're getting something from this. So, I mean, in terms of using back channels, these are some of the reasons what things that I've used them. Information sharing. You can get your your audience to share information. Audience response, as we just did then. It kind of democratizes the classroom a little bit because everyone can participate. Although you have to be sort of ready to, to sort of run a democratic classroom because you know there have been times when I've got things typed in like, oh God, when will lunch come? You know, will this never end or something like that? And you have to be prepared to live with that. Um, great for brainstorming. Um, for me, it's a good way of working without paper, not having to give out paper handouts in the classroom. And it becomes a record of the interaction. So students can go home, log into the chat room, and just pick up all the links or anything they wanted to from that day. Here's something. Anybody know who this poem is by? You can, if you're on the back channel, you can type in your response. Uh, let's see who, if anyone on the back channel's got it. Yes. Yeah, okay. No. Okay, so it's Robert Frost, yeah. Here's, a, here's another quote. Who, who's this one by? Yeah, this one's by Shakespeare, and there you should you see there's a, a kind of rose. Um, this is something that I've used with students sort of converting texts into SMS text messaging language um, to help them familiarize them with genre and um, just a way of sort of encouraging engagement and sort of adding some el element of fun to things that can be quite dry. Um, if you notice when you, to SMS texting language can be quite difficult to read if you don't read it out loud. When you just look at it, it can be difficult to, to analyze. But when you start to read it out loud, you'll, you'll notice that it's actually quite phonetic. Yeah. And when you say things out loud, then it starts to make sense. Um, so I found that kind of connection to phonetics quite um, useful. If, like me, you're absolutely terrible at SMS texting, um, you can very easily cheat. And this is the website that I use to cheat. I basically type. And I click on translate it. And there I've got my, my SMS texting language. And so I can start chatting with my students using SMS texting. <laughs> OK. And then I th I'll, ch I'll pass you the link in case you want to try that. So then my students either think I'm really cool <coughs> or, or a real geek. <laughs> Sad nerd, yeah. Okay, so that, that's one thing that I've used to con sort of convert materials and make them a bit more interesting for students. 
Um, it, it increases uh, engagement a bit, and we can sort of look at understanding the genre, thinking about sound communication for fun. If you don't like SMS texting and you're an English teacher, you can actually do the same thing quite easily um, in phonetic script. So, and here's a site that you can do that with. Let's make sure I spell it correctly. And once again, it does the work for me. Yeah. So if I want to, I can start um, using phonemic script instead. I'll pass you the link to that one, for those of you that teach English. That doesn't matter. American or English phonetics? Pardon? American or English phonetics? You can switch between an American and English if you want to. There's there's a few little um, there's a few little uh, things at the bottom there that you can use to. Uh... Any other languages? No, I'm afraid not. I don't have one for for converting to any other languages, but I think you can change it there to which kind you want and how you want it to display. Um, crowdsourcing. Anybody know what crowdsourcing is? If you're on the back channel, by all means type in your definition. <coughs> I share a quick tool that I've used with you for, for crowdsourcing. This is something called Tricider, and it's something that I'm, it creates kind of digital questionnaires It looks something like this. Actually, that's the wrong one. No, okay. That one I have to do. So we can create questionnaires to gather information from our students. So instead of having a questionnaire that we send to them and they just fill it in, they can actually create this questionnaire themselves. I've set up the the topic here and what I want and they can add their own ideas by typing in ideas here they can add pros and cons to each argument here and then they can vote on the ones that they like the best I'll pass the link to this out to the back channel and you can try it if you want to and uh, start adding some of your own ideas if you're online here. As I'm kind of a Twitter fanatic too, this links in with Twitter. So once you create these, you can share them in different places. You can share them through LinkedIn or Facebook, Facebook messages and Twitter or email them to your students and start crowdsourcing information from them. I found them very useful for things like needs analysis at the beginning of uh, courses. Okay, let's just tweet that out. come back to that and see if we get any responses. So it's a very easy tool to use. All you, all you have to do when you want to create one of these is click on create, type in your question, could be anything. and click on go and then you share the link with whoever you want to participate in it. It doesn't require any registration either which is kind of nice. In terms of doing things with students there's a few suggestions here for crowdsourcing with students and these are linked to examples. 
So if you download the presentation at the end, you can have a look at these. These questionnaires can also be embedded into e-learning e materials or online learning materials. So if you're building a course in Moodle, which I often end up doing, you can kind of embed these questionnaires into it so that they become part of your course. And you can start crowdsourcing information with students. It's very good to sort of preparation for discussions if you're trying to get students discussing things in class. Often if you sort of throw a discussion topic just at them in the classroom, they don't have thinking time to prepare different arguments for or against. Whereas if you get them to prepare something like this at home, they can start exchanging different pros and cons and different arguments around topics before they come to class. And it can make the classroom discussion a lot more kind of uh, fulfilling and productive. Um, so if you want to start crowdsourcing, then that's an easy tool to do it with. If you prefer kind of spoken communication, then you can create video crowdsourcing. And this is something called uh, Interview Me, where I've sort of done a similar thing, set up questionnaires and got students to reply using video webcams by sending them the link. Okay. And what it does is it, it collects together all the videos to, to the answers to each question. So this is an example here. Um, this was one of the questions. I've got 16 video responses. And all students have to do to uh, answer those is click, he said optimistically. Might be a bit slow. And uh, there you go. I can start answering it from my computer laptop. So below you'll see that there's my other students have answered questions there. So I can watch the other videos and see what other people have said. Um, I have the option to share them or to make this private or open. So I can start collecting kind of video spoken responses on different things. So interacting online doesn't just have to become about text and using text. It can be a bit about using voice and spoken voice uh, without having to download anything or anything like that. Just click, <coughs> just to prove it. Okay, hi there. Um, this is just, uh, um, oh God, no, stop. <laughs> Processing. Uh, yeah, I think I'll redo that. That's it. So I can actually watch it back before. Okay, hi there. Um, this is just, uh, um, oh God, no, stop. <laughs> yeah, I won't submit that one. But it's just that easy, and then I just click on submit, and that's uploaded. So you can get students recording voice and watching themselves online. I mean, I think. With language students, it's very good to get them watching themselves speaking and listening to themselves speaking because it does encourage them to reflect on their abilities and maybe to improve them. And especially if they're submitting a video of themselves speaking, then they'll try and do their very best and they might actually do some preparation for that. No. So that's a way of a very useful tool called Interview Me, which basically allows you to interview your students online and collect those kinds of responses. There's a few suggestions here for different ways you can use it and a link to an article that I wrote about it with some suggestions about how to do it and how to set it up. So uh, there you go. Actually I'll, I'll just go back a bit. I'll grab that link and I'll pass it to our to, to people here. So if you want to give it a try there's the link. If uh, probably not a good idea to try it while you're in this room, but um, you can have a look at some of the others if you have a moment. Is it that, is it that easy, really? If I, <coughs> um, the videos are stored online. Just in response to that question, the videos are stored online, and you can make them private or you can make them public. You can actually download and save the ones you want to keep and then just delete the rest. So you could, your students are quite protected in that way. So if you just want to collect some video clips of different people talking about different things, download them without actually having to go around with a video camera and doing it, that's quite a good way of doing it. Does it work through <coughs> mobile, the interview? I think the, uh, the, mobile, the interview doesn't work through mobile, this one doesn't. I'll show you one that does though. This is a, a question for you to think about. How often do you commute? 
communicate through video. Increasingly, it's becoming one of our digital life skills, I think. I do more and more communication through video, video conferencing or sending video messages nowadays, as I work quite internationally. Um, so, um, I'm using sort of video tools a lot more. This, this is a tool that I use um, within uh, online websites um, and online courses. I find it, it's very hard if you never meet students to build up a kind of relationship with them in the way that you can in a classroom and to sort of give them a sense of who you are, get a sense of who they are. This is something that I've used embedded into a course which helps to do that and helps to give a sense of presence. Now, I, I can send my students to this website or in, embed it into a course and it gives them the sense that I'm there waiting for their questions. <laughs> You know, my, I, I don't know about you, but most of my students, you know, when I was young, I thought my teachers actually lived in the school. You know? And so now you can actually confirm that by being there 24-7. Okay. And if my student has a question, they just need to type the question in here. What are you doing? And click on Ask. Um, I, I'm requiring login at the moment, so but you don't have to. You can make it open. And uh, what will happen is I'll get an alert on my phone, my iPhone, or, or through my email, and I can actually sit in front of my phone and answer those questions if I want to. Um, so I can pretty much answer them from anywhere. And the answers to the questions get collected here. Um, so if there's a question that's already been asked, they can just click on here and watch the, watch the pre-recorded response. It's going pretty slowly on here, but... Okay, come on. Okay, I'll leave that for now because that's... What are you doing, Nick? The worst thing about this is that actually most of the... Oh yeah, there it is. Yeah. Oh. Oh, that's a, I got a question during a conference, so I thought I'd answer it there and then as a demonstration. <coughs> yeah. But um, it builds up sort of some sense of engagement and, and kind of a bit of who you are and your personality, which can often be very difficult to put into online courses or, or e-learning when you never p meet people. So that's something that I like to do. Unfortunately, I end up answering most of the questions early in the morning when I'm feeling pretty rough and I don't look my best. But, you know. So if you're self-conscious about those things, you know, set a time of day when you look your best and you can answer all your questions. <laughs> okay, I'll pass you the link to that for those of you that are in our back channel. Um, so if you want to, you can start sending in messages. I won't have time to answer them immediately. Yeah, I think so. Would they take you seriously? Um, it, it depends. Um, I, you know, it depends on the relationship you have with your students, I guess. I mean, my, my kind of video, my, my introduction video there, my little waiting one, is quite something quite light-hearted. But if you wanted sort of something a bit more, to record something a bit more serious, you could. Um, I, ha I, I used to presented this to a group of teachers in Greece who said, well, you know, this is great, but my students have no interest in me whatsoever, <laughs> you know, and, which I, I felt very sympathetic about. But if, if you go to the website, the VU website, there are actually lots of these different video booths there. So you can find someone who they might be more interested in, and they can send them questions. For example, o Opera Winfrey also has a, a, Q a VU video booth. So if they're interested in Opera Winfrey, they can send her questions. Or there are kind of a few kind of minor stars or something like that there that you can check out. So mine isn't the only one, and yours doesn't have to be the only one. Let's <coughs> see how I'm doing for time. So, and that, that's what it looks like on your phone. When you answer the questions on your phone, you just have this big button and you hold it up in front of you, you press record, and you record your response. So very easy to do, and it's free. All of it's free. Um, if you just want to get sort of some spoken interaction between you and your students, there's a very useful website called MailView. And again, it records um, speaking, there it is, directly from your web browser. 
so you don't have to download or upload anything. You record your, um, it will record up to 10 minutes, I'll do a quick one. Uh, hel hello everybody, um, this is me, I'm speaking from here and I'm running out of time so I'll make this quite short. Click on stop, I can now watch that back again. So it's a tool that we can then use to get students doing speaking homework at home. Then they just email it to uh, whoever they want to send it to. Nick, your email address. And I'll send it to you. Next, uh, subject. Next. Submit. Okay, so my message has been sent. So what I'll get in my email account is just a, a link to that website now. If I click on OK, you can also just share the link. So if I go, yes, no, copy to clipboard. Okay. And what my students will see, or what my teacher will see if my students are sending it to me, is just something like that. They'll get a link to this in their email. Um, this is me, I'm speaking from here, and I'm running out of time, so... Just to prove that's real, there you go. And a link to the website if you want to try it. We've been here before, lots of teacher loaded activity with preparation time engagement, so maybe get a small number of students. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think this, this kind of stuff, if you're getting students to do things like this, um, it doesn't require an awful lot of preparation. You know, any speaking activity can be, be adapted for this. You know, it could be 10 minutes of speaking about almost anything. You know, talk about what you did at the weekend, talk about you know, your last holiday talk about and show us something that's important to you in your life. You know, it takes almost no preparation. You know, students just have to do their recording. They get to watch themselves, reflect on their abilities, try to improve it, and they send it to you. And you can reply in the same way so that you build up a communication. So what you end up with instead of you know, passing pieces of paper about or passing email as about is you're actually involved in some real communication, spoken communication with them replying to each other's messages. You know. it, it's actually you know, quicker to record a response to somebody's homework using something like this than it is to go through it with a red pen or go through it on Word and mark in mistakes. You, know, you can respond to all, uh, orally quite quickly. So for me it's kind of a, a time saver more than a time waster. But you have to decide what works for you. And again, it works on mobile, so if you're feeling sort of particularly um, disconnected or you're on the move, you can just record your, your messages and send them directly from your mobile phone. No uploading, no downloading, it's all free. Nobody has to register. You know, it couldn't be more simple, really. Um, listening activities in class, yeah. Listening activities in class are very often, you know, very teacher controlled. Teacher controls used to be a tape player when I was in the classroom. Now it's probably a CD or an MP3 file. You play it, all your students listen at the same speed. They try and get the answers right or wrong. You know, not much interactivity there, not much student-led control. Um, this is an alternative. It's something called Voxopop. And uh, the way it works is um, you can set up listening activities that students actually respond to and you can sort of build up threads so that they have to listen to each other and add to it. Now this one was a chain story that I started off. Um, Once upon a time, there was a young boy called Harold and while he was walking down the street, he suddenly saw... Okay, then the next student had to record something. However, the big pink elephant was at the house, so he had to ask for directions. Then he looked around and saw a very little big mouse. 
I'll stop it there. Um, so basically what, what students have to do before they add their contribution is they have to listen to each other. Yeah, that's novel, isn't it? Students actually listening to each other. Um, and then they get to the end and they just add their part to the message. They click on record the message. Okay, take me to the sign up page. Hang on, I'm logged in. They'll have to log in. I've logged in already, so that should be there. Ah. And they just click on here and they can record their message directly into the browser. They don't have to download anything, upload anything, or anything like that. And so they can make their listening a bit more interactive. I'll, I'll pass you the link to that if anyone wants to register and have a try at some point. There are there are three different examples there when you download the presentation that you can try. One is the chain story that we just looked at. One is a drill. So instead of sort of standing in front of the class and drilling them doing language examples, you know, they, you can record one, they can listen to it and each add their own version of it. Or you can create discussions and they can listen to each other. It's very easy to set up and it's free. Okay, I'm desperately running out of time. I'll skip that one. Um, there's just something that I'd like to show you about collaborative writing. This is uh, often something that is get difficult to get students to do together. Um, this is a tool that I use that creates a piece of interactive paper and you can get four students to work together on different computers to create a text. Here's an example of one that I used. I actually used it and set up some revision questions and then got my students to sort of answer them as groups. Here, on this side, you can just about see there's a chat, chat room on the side. So while they're working, I can type in messages and send them messages and redirect them if they need to. And each student's contribution is color coded. Just let me uh, up that a bit. Okay, so some students have written in pink, some in blue. So. On, I know which students are writing because it identifies which students are writing in each colour. So what's kind of nice about that is that actually it has this thing called a time slider which I really love. Anyone who's interested in how their students create text will like this because you can actually replay their creation of the text. It acts like a little tape recorder. Okay, and I can see my students writing in now. So I can record how they created things, what things they, they crossed out and went back, and how they self-corrected. So it records the act of text creation, which gives you a really valuable insight into your student's mind and how they write and what they're thinking about when they write. Um, it's also quite useful if, if you have students who tend to copy other people's work, because you can see at which point somebody, you know, deletes everybody else's work, copy and paste it as their own, you know, which is quite nice. And you can, you can go back and show them this. So for me, you know, this is kind of really interesting tool. You know, I was able to see who answered the most questions in the text and, and things like that. And again, it is, it's really easy to create something like this. No, no registration required. You go to this website, which is called Synced In, and you click on this big green note that says Create Public Note, and it has a text in there. You delete that, and you write in your writing task. So mine could be, uh, oop, let's make it a bit bigger. Okay, and then I just need to copy that and send that, share that link with my students. I can share it through Twitter or through Delicious or LinkedIn or Facebook or something like that if I want to post it out to kind of social media connections. Or I, I'll just share it with you now. And you can have a, anyone who's connected, oh, that's the wrong link. Anyone who's connected can have a go. I'll stop in just a couple of minutes. Just let me have <coughs> Okay, let's try again. Copy that link. There you go. So if anybody wants to start working on that story together, you can have a look and see how that works and play with it. 
um, they, the, the actual activities that they do in this don't need to be saved. They're all automatically saved. So you can go back and find them. As long as you have the link up the top here, you can find them years later. When students close the browser, the text stays there. If they want to, they can copy and paste it into a Word document. Um, so, you know, I found that a very useful tool. It works synchronously and asynchronously, so they don't have to be in the same room typing at the same time, but they can be. It works with groups of up to four. That gives you one space left as a tutor to go in and work and see what they're doing. You can get them creating narrative, uh, working as group, with groups on tests. You can do dictations and get them to dictate into, write into it what you dictate. And then you can see which bits they're hearing and what bits they're having problems with when you play it back afterwards. Um, you can get them to peer edit text so that they create their own sheet in their own text and then share them, peer edit them, add things. Um, error correction, text development, all those kinds of things, and they can do them collaboratively and online. You know, for me, that's a wonderful tool for developing writing skills. Um, there's loads more here which I haven't had time for. Um, thanks for listening. Uh, there are a few things like links to my blogs. So there's a free book that I wrote that you can download. Um, what I've shown you is just the tip of the iceberg. There are masses more tools. I collect them together on this website. There are two or three hundred ones there. If you want to go and have a look through them, they're being added to all the time. Um, I work for Bell Educational Services, and they're paying for me to come here, which is nice, so I'm giving them a plug. And if you want to download the presentation, you can download it from this URL, or if you have one of those cameras that has a QR scanner on, you can scan it directly onto your phone. I hope, if it works. Okay, if not, just take a picture of that and download it at home. All the links are there. There are some links to some background reading. And um, so, uh, as my friend would say, fill your boots. Okay, thank you very much. Right, now you've all been asking questions all the way through, so we'll be expecting a full <laughs> oh, we got question time. Essay yeah. answer from you, but um, if anyone actually wants to ask a question with words, like, are any of these tools available as apps? As apps, um, some of the web-based tools also have apps. The, the last one, the synced in one that I showed you with, for the text, will also run on an iPad. It doesn't run as well, but it will run. Okay. Um, so. And what I do when my students are working on it, I, I, flip, I have my iPad out and I go around so I can flip through checking which different groups are doing what, so, which is quite nice because you're wandering around with your iPad and you're not having to look over their shoulder or anything. It's nice, yeah. There's a question there. Oh, thank you, Jane. I need to answer this. Um, I have two questions. One is um, security, being freeware. The other one is if you start using these applications and you integrate them into your, your, your teaching practices, being freeware, and they're pulled off, what does the teacher do then? Um, I'll, I'll deal with the second question first, the word when things disappear. Inevitably, things do disappear. I mean, a lot of them are freeware, but you can pay for them, and, and that gives you a degree of more security. But I think one of the problems, problems, it's also a good thing, the internet's changing all the time. What's possible is changing all the time. And I think as teachers, we need to accept that things are temporary. We're going to have to keep moving, keep developing our practice. So if things um, disappear, then we look for something else. And usually when you look for something else, something else better is there. I mean, that's what I found with the things that I've lost. I used to have something called, um, what was it called? Slink set where I collected together a reading list. You know, I had 600 links on it and they disappeared, you know, within the space of a week. Usually, when they disappear, you get a notice to download anything you have on it. So I downloaded it, started looking around, and I found Scoop It, which turned out to be 10 times better. You know, so yes, things will disappear, you know, but other things come along. In terms of security, you know, it really depends on, on what you're posting on them. 
you know, security with any computer, security when you're walking around in a room, security when you're walking around in a city, you know, if you walk around London for the day, you're on 300 CCTV cameras during, during the whole day. You know, security is kind of an issue that's best protected by, you know, thinking about what you share. You know, if it's just an art, a, a sort of story about what you did at the weekend, you know, then I don't think we've got really that much to lose. But, you know, it is an issue. But be, just be careful about it, really, and be wise. Any other questions? Okay, I'll put the link back up for the slides if anybody's missed it. Um, it's different from wikis because on a wiki you'd build up a series of pages and usually you do that would happen quite slowly one person creating a page other person people may be editing it with sync in you've got a single page it's like one sheet of paper that everybody can write into at the same time you know there's no kind of overall control of somebody edits it and somebody controls it or owns it anybody who's writing into it at that time owns it you know, and they can all contribute. So it's just like if you imagine it as a piece of paper and four people with pens writing on it. Yeah. Brendan, I'm going to have to stop it there. I mean, I'm sure you've got lots more questions, but you can post them on the website for the back channel. Yeah. Think, yeah. And hopefully, you'll answer one or two of them. Yeah. Um, we're going to go for coffee in just a minute, and um, we do want to start the next sessions probably at quarter to twelve. Um, I don't think anyone's going to mind if you take your coffee and we.